Welcome to another episode of Elixir Wizards. A podcast brought to you by Smart Logic, a custom web and mobile development shop. This is season 11, where we're branching out from Elixir to compare notes with experts from other communities. Hey everyone, I'm Dan Ivovich, Director of Engineering at Smart Logic, and I'm your host for today's episode. For episode 7, we're joined by Dan Plukin, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Southern Denmark, and Manuel Rubio, author of Erlang OTP, A Concurrent World. In this episode, we're comparing notes on garbage collection in Erlang and Akka. Welcome to the show, Dan. Hi, thanks. I'm happy to be here. And welcome to the show, Manuel. Thank you. Happy and in the same way to be here. Fantastic. So let's learn a little bit more about you guys. Manuel, why don't you kick us off? Who are you? Where are you from? What are you up to? And why Erlang? I'm from Spain, but at this moment I'm living in the Netherlands. I was using Erlang since 2009. And Elixir for a bit less, 2016, I started using it. And well, my first time that I were into this uh, world of Erlang, Elixir, and BIM uh, was because uh, we needed something different to PHP, Java, or C that were the typical languages we were using in a telco company. So we were searching something that could be clustering with the servers and sharing information, handling the concurrency in a good way. So we were a bit tired of using always the POSIX uh, signals, shared memory in the operating system. We found Erland and uh, in the first year, 2009, 2010, we implemented different solutions. We even assisted to implement big telco solutions in Spain. And after that, I was entirely combined uh, to dedicate the rest of my growing in my career dedicated to that because I was uh, focusing on the backend development. So I think that the Erlang and after that Elixir was fitting very well. Great. And Dan, how about you? Background, language experience, what are you up to these days? Yeah, pretty different background. So I'm, I'm a researcher. I'm, I'm based in Chicago, but I work for the University of Southern Denmark. And I'm just finishing my PhD for the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Urbana, Illinois being the greatest city in the world, of course. And I did my thesis on the topic of actor garbage collection. So my background was a lot more in kind of theoretical computer science, like 80% of my thesis is proofs. But as part of that work, I developed this actor garbage collector for the ACA actor framework. And so in so doing, that gave me a bit of, a bit of knowledge with JVM, Scala type of stuff. But it's a very different type of problem, actor garbage collection, with than ordinary garbage collection, which I think we'll talk about maybe later in this episode. Awesome. So for our audience that is you know more heavily on the Elixir Erlang side, could you just explain quickly how Scala, Akka, the JVM kind of all relate? Scala is the language for the JVM, just like Java is. And Akka is pretty much, it, it's emerged as the standard actor framework for the JVM there, for both Java and Scala. I'm not sure about how other JVM-based languages, whether they use Akka or not, but definitely Scala and Java. Akka is basically, you can think of it as like a re-implementation of Elixir slash Erlang for Scala. They have the same ideas of supervision trees, you know, messages, clustering. The main difference is the terminology. Instead of what they call a process in Elixir, they would call an actor in Akka, and what they call a PID, a PID in Erlang is an actor reference. Pretty much everything else is just straight translation. Fantastic. So Manuel, when you think about the importance of garbage collection in Erlang, in actors, you know, your, your concurrent world book, what is your perspective on the actor approach? Well, in Erlang, in the BIM, and more specifically, the garbage collection, because most of the languages that are on top of the BIM are immutable based on the memory that they use. BIM has the property that is soft real time. The garbage collector in BIM has to fit the features that cannot stop the war. It's vain to remove the memory that is not in use anymore when it's possible. And because the immutability is a fact and something that uh, you cannot avoid using BIM, it's very easy for the algorithm to get all the memory that is not in use anymore when the functions uh, are finished uh, for the processes or even when the processes are finished finally. Awesome. And so Dan, your work on garbage collection of actors, 
you know, what does that mean for an actor to be garbage collected from your perspective? And how is that different from the ordinary garbage collection that programmers just know and love so well? That's a good start. So an actor that, again, that's like a process. And the idea is that we're automatically figuring out when these, I'll, I'll say the word processed whenever possible, given the audience. We're trying to figure out when these processes can safely be killed. And it's a pretty different problem. With ordinary garbage collection, what you're really trying to do is figure out when these objects are garbage. And an object is garbage if no thread can reach it, right? So we're talking really about reachability from threads. So you have these things called tracing garbage collectors. Most of the big garbage collectors that we know in the JVM, for example, they're tracing garbage collectors. But for actors, it's a pretty different problem. And we use a, a lot of different approaches compared to that. Maybe I'll, I'll say, what's an application when you would use actor garbage collection? A very simple case would be in Elixir, yeah, you spawn off some process to do a little bit of work. Maybe you send it some messages. It sends you back some messages. Then you're done with that process. Now, the process is just sitting there taking up memory. So hopefully you remember to, to kill it. And hopefully you make sure to do it in the correct way and then nobody else is using that process. So that's a very simple case where you would want to do that. Normally, you have to do it manually. It would be nice if we could do it automatically. A more complicated example uh, is maybe in Hadoop, like the Hadoop uh, cluster computing framework. You've got all these different nodes in your cluster, and you're trying to uh, allocate containers to those different nodes, and those containers are going to do a little bit of work, right? And if you actually look in the Hadoop code base, those containers are wrapped inside of basically what is an actor. And that actor is going to be managing the container, but it's also going to be talking to some kind of manager on another node. It's going to be talking to some distributed file system actors on some other nodes. And we want to figure out when this container actor is safe to kill because then we can deallocate that container and then we can reuse that space for something else. But that's a pretty challenging thing because now you have to reason about the whole state of your kind of distributed system, right? How does this actor relate to all these other actors? Are they done talking to one another? Have messages been dropped? Have some nodes crashed? So you have to reason about all these kinds of failures as well, in addition to all the differences between actors and objects. So that's giving a little bit of a taste of how that works. But the main idea I want to come across is that we're working in some kind of distributed system, at least that's what most of my research was focused on, and trying to figure out when one of these processes, its memory is safe to free up. Right, right. So you're taking the actor idea and saying, now it's distributed, so the people who may need to send a message to this actor, you know, or the people who care about it still existing is somewhere within a cluster. And so mm -hmm. that kind of turns the, when can we really free this? When can this process really go away? To like a whole nother level if you're trying to do it automatically and not have your system kind of self-supervise, self-orchestrate when pieces are no longer necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Great. And so Manuel, thinking about that, how do you feel that kind of compares to your work in Erlang and with the OTP? Well, regarding the specific part of the uh, sending of the messages, for example, I think uh, that is uh, pretty similar when you quote uh, to a function because uh, what well, depends on if uh, that is uh, local to a process that is in the same machine or if it, that is uh, a process that is in the other machine, of course. Uh, when you are sending something between processes inside of the same machine, that could be or copy the information to being used uh, for the new process because uh, each process has its own heap. So it's needed to get that information inside of the heap of the memory of the process. But could be happen also that we could configure that the information is of heap. So the fragments that are generated outside of the heap of the memory are plugged in some way. When we are configuring the up heap memory for the messages, it's behaving a bit different. That is a tuning that could apply depending on the use case of our processes. So if you are going to get something that is very heavy, and it's going to receive a lot of messages inside of a process, but the process is running continuously and uh, you don't want to get interrupted to put the information into the heap. You can configure it uh, as off heap, and then that is reserving outside memory uh, to being used and is not interrupting the process. In that way, the handling of the memory for the heaps is completely isolated. And because Erlang nor Elixir has objects, it's pretty simple that you have only processes, uh, functions, and that's all. It's uh, the only way that uh, you can copy and handle memory between the, the different parts of the code. So then does that mean that there's a, a concept of generational garbage collection in Erlang? 
in addition to kind of just the actor approach? Or could you go a little bit deeper on that? Yeah, the way of the memory is handled in the airline is, as you say, generational. When we are reserving memory, that is creating a specific heap, that is the young heap. When all the information is, uh, all the variables, uh, functions are running and the ESR requesting more memory, that has a specific mark that when it's transpassing that mark is executing the, the garbage collector. Mm -hmm. So when that amount of functions are running and the, you are needed different runnings of the garbage collector that is generating a new heap that is called the old heap. And that is where the long life elements of the memory are living because they are more in use than the, the younger ones that is clean. Well, I mean, I'm <laughs> maybe the messing a bit with that, but. It is uh, not uh, too easy to explain without the graphics, but when you are cleaning the memory, Erlang is always performing a copy and write. So it's creating a new heap and it's not removing, it's only copying what should be keep it and then removing the whole heap that is not in use anymore. But in another process, all heap that is called for the long life elements is a uh, like another long life process that is performed later to get all the long life elements from the young heap and then moving that for the old heap. There are a lot of papers that is telling that this is a good way to perform a cleaning because the young heap is where the most of the times the removing elements are, are happening. So when you are moving everything to the old heap, then the, you don't need the, to run the garbage collector so often for that heap. You are like running the, the different cleaning or the garbage collection for both, but with different frequencies. Excellent. And so Dan, does generational garbage collection kind of apply to Akka's actor approach as well? Well, let me clarify something I realized that might be ambiguous. So Akka is built on the JVM and the JVM has its own existing garbage collector. So the stuff that Manuel is talking about for doing garbage collection, it applies equally well to what Akka is already doing. And the stuff that I'm working on, the actor garbage collection is something that you can add to Akka. That's what I implemented, but could also potentially be applied to Erlang and Elixir, right? So these are complementary approaches. That said, I do know that the JVM, I, I believe it does use some very advanced form of a generational collection. It doesn't do stop the world. I think it's a common myth that the JVM uses that. It, it's, it's extremely efficient. It's extremely concurrent. They do very smart things there. It's a very different problem, but the beam can kind of take advantage of a lot of things that Manuel talked about because it has immutability by default. So that said, the question about the actor garbage collection in Akka, it's a very different paradigm, although there were some overlaps. Historically, there were some uh, tracing-based garbage collectors for actors, although they had to do a lot of extra complications because actors are different from objects. My approach is pretty different. And also there's a well-known uh, actor programming language called Pony, which also has actor garbage collection in addition to regular garbage collection. My approach and Pony's approach, they both use this kind of more message-based approach, basically, without going too much into detail of it. Answering the question about the generational stuff is interesting because Pony's algorithm, it's not very flexible in terms of what kinds of optimizations you can do. For example, doing some kind of generational type of collection. Mine kind of built up on top of Pony and released some restrictions. For example, Pony's algorithm requires causal message delivery, which is something that's kind of often you don't get that in a distributed system when you have multiple in a cluster, but you do often get it when you have it on a single machine. So mine removes some of those restrictions. And in removing those restrictions, it creates a lot more optimizations, uh, opportunities for optimization. So for example, what actors do is periodically they send these updates to the local garbage collector, but you can tune how frequently they send those updates. So for example, if you have an actor that you suspect is going to be a long-lived actor, maybe it's just already survived for X amount of time, so you think probably it's not going to become garbage anytime soon, you can reduce the frequency of how often it will send updates to the garbage collector. The garbage collector itself, the actor collector, it creates kind of a view of the distributed system kind of its own version of the heap, and it needs to search that heap. In that case, you can also do some kind of generational approaches. You can say, I'm only going to be interested in checking these particular nodes or these particular short-lived actors in the cluster. So you can add those kinds of optimizations there. 
But the, what I want to emphasize is that this is very new research that we're actively developing, and we're finding out ways that the traditional garbage collection approach can uh, be applied in this kind of scenario, and that's really exciting. So I, I, I do have a lot of hope that uh, generational approaches and other insights can also um, be brought to bear on this work. Thinking about this garbage collection approach, there must be some downsides, right? Manuel, do you have thoughts on how garbage collection is handled in this actor process model? Are there any downsides or things that you feel like we hit up against inside OTP? I was not studying theoretically uh, what could be the downsides, but in my experience, I found a couple of them because when I was called for consultancy for companies, I found that sometimes the release of the memory is not happening so often or or maybe the, the opposite is uh, too often and then the, the memory is released, but the CPU is uh, overloaded because uh, the, the heavy load of the system is requesting us to tone up the system to get uh, the correct values for the for the garbage collection. In Ireland, you have uh, specific functions to force to run the garbage collection in the old heap or even in the younger. But uh, in the old heap, we have a, a specific command that uh, you say, at this moment, I, I want uh, you remove uh, the old elements. And that is very in use, for example, when you are uh, implementing for example, a web service that is handling a lot of or, or massive information for JSON or XML that you have to transform a lot of data and handling a lot, a lot of data that is performing a lot of changes of that data in the memory and then that is inside of the memory at that moment, inside of the functions because you did that in those specific functions and then Previously, to go out or for from that function, maybe you say, okay, in this moment, at this moment, release the memory to to keep clean of uh, all the mess you did uh, with the transformations in the memory. Yeah, the the downsides for that is because you are keeping everything in the memory and is uh, immutable. Everything that is copied when you are calling a lot of functions is uh, remaining there. So in some times or some specific moments, you can realize that uh, you are running out of memory. Or even if you need to run a lot of times the garbage collection, that could happen that looks like the server is too overloaded uh, when the, you are not uh, receiving a lot of requests. So it's a part of adjusting those values. Maybe... It, is one of the downsides that you have to keep in, in mind that uh, it's working that way and that you need uh, to adjust those values. Uh, it reminds me of a few years ago, we were working on a Phoenix API and we were working with the DevOps team, kind of external, that wasn't familiar with Erlang and kind of how its approach to things were. And so we were, we were pegging the CPU a lot because we were just processing as much as we could but we weren't memory constrained at all. And so like the memory was flat, but the CPU was like pegged. And so like they thought it wasn't caving and we're like, no, no, it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is not losing a bunch of, you know, it's not fragmenting the memory and, and, and growing exponentially there. It's just leveraging every process it can. And, you know, we could scale it up if we want to, but it's processing things fast enough. So it's all good. Like we need to like tune our alerts and it kind of makes me think similarly around, you know, like you said, you can free memory so fast that, you know, you end up with other constraints or maybe you want to hold on to things longer. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that, you know, we get really great performance out of the box with Erlang and the Elixir community, but there is still opportunity to adjust how things go. So Dan, thinking through that, I'm sure downsides must be a, a big part of what you think about in your research. Any kind of particular things that you want to touch on thinking about actor garbage collection and its limitations? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, the exact same problems that Manuel was talking about, we would have in an actor garbage collection approach. How do you tune uh, how much work the actor garbage collector is going to do versus how much work the application is going to do. And that's always going to be a balancing act. And it would be interesting to in incorporate some, maybe some static approaches in a language. For example, what Rust is doing. There's some flaws to Rust's approach, I believe, but that's, I, I think, an interesting step as well. It'd be interesting to think about what Rust would. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got sidetracked there for a second. I'll say this, particularly with the actor garbage collection thing, when you're detecting if an actor is garbage or not, one of the restrictions that we have to impose that is unusual is we manage your actor references for you. So right now in, for example, Erlang and, and in uh, Elixir and in Akka, 
a process ID is kind of just this value that you can pass around. You could stick it in a data structure. You can do whatever you want with it. You can put it right into a file probably if you want. At least you can do that in Akka. And it, it's kind of analogous to how in C you can just throw around these pointers. You can do whatever you want with pointers. But pointers are kind of the enemy of garbage collectors. If you can just do whatever you want with a pointer, then the garbage collector has a hard time keeping track of all that. And so you get a language like Java where you don't have access to the pointers directly. You have access to these references that are more constrained. You can't store a pointer to a Java object into a file. And similarly, if you have an actor garbage collector, we need to keep track of these actor references that you're passing around. And so there are going to be some additional restrictions to how you use your actor references. You can't just you know write your actor reference to a file, then somebody else reads from that file, and then they send a message to that actor. Because the garbage collector has no way of keeping track of that flow of information that, that kind of leaked through the file. So that's kind of a, a restriction in terms of just the programming of it. Although on the other hand, hopefully if you have an actor garbage collector, it reduces some of the code that you would have to write. It would have to reduce, it would reduce the killing, obviously, that you have to do, but also the tracking of when is it safe to kill a particular process. So that's kind of the programming angle of it. But there's also, of course, the runtime angle. And, and there's a, some differences there too for actors versus uh, ordinary objects. Because for objects, we talked about a little bit, if you have a copying garbage collector, right? So you get rid of this garbage and then you move the objects to some other part of the memory and they get closer together. So you can actually get some increased locality there as a result of garbage collection. So some work has found that actually if you introduce a garbage collector into certain kinds of algorithms, you actually get a speed up. It's faster allocations and Im improved locality. But you don't get that type of situation for actors because actors don't really benefit from being close to one another. They, they just have a different type of processing model. So we aren't going to get those kinds of locality speedups that you would get with ordinary garbage, which is kind of interesting. On the other hand, you would maybe get some performance advantages from the fact that if you were killing your processes in an incorrect way, maybe you were killing a process too early and that triggers some fault handling mechanism or something like that, that reduces performance. Maybe an automatic garbage collector would kind of speed things up. So there's kind of this trade-off but where you're letting this thing do work for you, and hopefully it's going to do a better job than you will, but you're, you are giving it some of your time, your precious time that you would spend doing work yourself uh, for your own application. Fantastic. So then, Manuel, how do you think about balancing those performance trade-offs? You mentioned kind of a little bit earlier, right? Like freeing too quickly, freeing not quickly enough, CPU pressure. Any other kind of like important things to consider when you're thinking about performance trade-offs in the Erlang garbage collection approach? In my experience, uh, I suffer a lot of uh, different languages and uh, virtual machines. And uh, Beam, I have to admit that I was starting with that because of the requirements of the kind of work uh, I usually do. In terms of trade-offs, I think that maybe because the way of the management of the memory is working, in the garbage collector, it's needed to run a lot of times because that is copying the, uh, we have different heaps that is not possible to reuse most of the times, different parts or different portions of memory. It's not completely true because uh, if we are using binaries, for, for example, and binaries is uh, greater than the 64 bytes that is uh, stored in a specific uh, part of the memory that is for the virtual machine. But uh, for the rest of the elements, if uh, we need, uh, for example, to compose a list, a tuple, or pass that amount of information directly to another process, or even to handle that between functions is not uh, a problem. But uh, transmitting that information to different uh, processes is not possible to referentiate that information that is copied again and again. So I think the trade-off is not in in the garbage collector, but in the way that the memory is handling inside of the beam. And of course, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> and the new uh, features that uh, were implementing there for speed up the beam were solving this specifically because uh, you know that uh, every year the Ericsson is launching new features for the speed up and the garbage collector was uh, reviewed, I think, three years ago or so, something like that. Uh, memory management and the, the speed up uh, using the just-in-time compilation. Mm -hmm. So 
in terms of how the memory is working, from my point of view and uh, my experience, it's not as performant as other languages like uh, Java, for example, because uh, Java is uh, very optimized uh, in input-output memory handling. But in other terms, I think uh, BIM is more secure because that data is copied and is not referenced. Mm -hmm. If uh, some process is uh, needed to be stopped at Terminator or is corrupting the, the information, uh, well, again, it's very difficult to do that in an immutable state, no? But if uh, that is happening, whatever is the reason, because uh, we can plug uh, always C code uh, in our programs, that is uh, still protected uh, because it's in another heap. Mm -hmm. So Dan, are there any kind of specific fault recovery or fault tolerance aspects to the actor approach and what Akka is, is adding as a framework? The main thing that I was trying to overcome in my thesis was trying to deal with faults. For example, uh, nodes crashing or just nodes operating very slowly or messages being dropped. And that's something that wasn't really addressed very well in prior work or hasn't been the focus. So actor garbage collection is much less researched than other kinds of garbage collections, especially distributed garbage collection. And so, for example, in Pony's garbage collection, which I mentioned before, they don't address faults, they don't address dropped messages, because that kind of wasn't in, in their model that they were trying to target. Whereas there's an, another actor language called Salsa that does have some limited support for fault tolerance. So what will happen is if a particular node gets is just slow or if it crashes, then the garbage collectors for the other nodes will kind of, they'll ignore the information from that particular node that's faulty, and they'll try and do the, their best garbage collection on this half of the cluster. And the, the main thing that I was trying to work on, number one was dealing with dropped messages, which wasn't really addressed in some of the prior work. And another case is a limitation in this salsa garbage collector, which, so we say that <laughs> the terminology is a little bit confused, so I have to clarify. So the salsa, salsa garbage collector, we say that it's fault tolerant because if a node crashes, some of the other nodes can still make progress in doing some garbage collection. But here's this problem. Let's say that I have an actor on my node and it has a reference to an actor on Manuel's node and I crash. In a fault tolerant garbage collector like Salsa, Manuel's actor has to not be garbage collected. It can never be garbage collected because we don't know, it, we, we don't actually explicitly handle the fact that I am permanently down, that my node is permanently down, my actor will never send messages to Manuel's actor. We have to be pessimistic and say, maybe it eventually will come online and will send a message to Manuel. And one of the things that we were able to do, partly because of Akka's particular fault model, which is a slightly different fault model than Erlang, we were able to say, what happens in, in Akka is a node will actually, if it's slow enough, it will get kicked out of the cluster and all of the actors will have to be killed. And we have a guarantee that if that node rejoins in Akka, it will have to rejoin like with a new hat on, with a new set of actors. And so those actors, you can actually guarantee that they were gone. And we can take advantage of that semantics and say, okay, because now we can guarantee that my node is really crashed, it's really gone, or maybe it wasn't really crashed, maybe it was just really slow and it got kicked mm -hmm. out of the cluster. You have to consider these kinds of things in a distributed system. Because we can have those guarantees, we can actually figure out, indeed, the actor on Manuel's node can be garbage collected. And this was kind of the, the hardest problem that we really need to solve. You, crucially, you need to solve this problem. If you're going to be doing any kind of resource management in a distributed system, you need to be able to reason about dropped messages and, and crashed nodes like that, or you know, slow nodes that got removed. So that's the kind of thing that I was working on mm -hmm. dealing with. I think it's interesting. The optimistic approach of garbage collection came up a lot in the first half hour of this conversation. And then here we are finally, and we're like, and here's where you have to be pessimistic. But maybe you should be so pessimistic that you assume it will never come back. It kind of reminds me of Erlang's like let it crash approach of just like, you know, if it has an issue, let it die and then handle the fact that it is dead and going to get recreated as just like normal behavior. And I think there's some parallels to what you were saying there, Dan, around you know, hey, if it's slow, if it gets network isolated, or if it actually crashes, just say, you're welcome to come back when you're fixed, but we'll have collected everything that was related to you because like, it's pessimistic that you may come back, but it's also optimistic that you know, we want that memory, we want that space back, and you may never join again. And you know, these, these trade-offs, I think, are particularly interesting. I think you're right about that. And it's interesting that Akka 
does the let it crash in that sense better than Erlang? Because Erlang, if, for example, like I'm monitoring an actor, I'm watching an actor that's on a different node, and then that node crashes, the message that I get back is just that the node disconnected. Mm -hmm. I don't get any kinds of promises that that node will never rejoin. So in that sense, Akka gives us a little bit of a better guarantee. And so that's part of the reason why, you know, I said that this work that I'm doing could be applied potentially to Erlang and Elixir. That's kind of the main limitation. If you want to get this fault recovering aspect mm -hmm. that my collector uses, we would have to somehow patch that into Erlang to get that stronger semantics. Sure. Excellent. I guess to either of you, maybe we'll start with Manuel. Advice you'd give to developers dealing with garbage collection challenges in a distributed system or things you kind of wish developers understood about how Erlang thinks about garbage collection? I mean, you wrote a, you wrote a whole book, so it's probably an idea or two. I was thinking about the last part that I was telling Dan, because in Erlang, as you say, it is not possible to now, uh, when you are monitoring the processes uh, from other nodes, if uh, you are disconnected because a network is split or whatever else, uh, you have the problem that when the network split is resolved or the connectivity latency is back, you are disconnected from the other node. But I think the Erlang is preparing to the programmer <laughs> to think about that because even when the, we were talking about the garbage collector, you have different flags and different configurations for the garbage collector. So you are on charge of tuning up, develop your own mechanics for the basics. And the Erlang is providing you the, the idioms to create the software, but the implementation of Raft, Gossip or whatever else is on you. <laughs> So uh, the Erlang can provide you the way of monitoring other nodes, monitoring other processes. But if something is failing, you are on charge of deciding how to act about that. So you can use a library that is using Paxos, other that is using Raft or, or whatever else. It's, you are not depending on the low level at, the, at that moment. You have to implement your own. Answering to the, the question of Dan, the advice about the garbage collection is always, I give always the same. So it's, if you are developing a an, an, uh, heavy load uh, system, because you are going to receive a lot of uh, messages, you are even creating a cluster that has going to share information or access to different processes. It's not uh, common in Elixir, but I have the, the hope that the people is uh, starting to use more OTP in Elixir and developing the processes, actors, uh, supervisors, uh, and other mechanics that the language has. And they can realize that it's very simple and very easy to, to get into those elements, realize how it's working the system for them, how it's handling the memory, how it's handling the, every part of the system and how can they adjust for their system to run as well as possible or <laughs> in the best way. And yeah, is my main advice. Excellent. Dan, your research, you know, is research, maybe a little, a little less in the weeds with the developers, but do you have anything from your view or as you've done your research that you kind of wish developers understood about your approach or the challenges that exist in distributed systems. I'd like them to know that a garbage collector for actors exists and that they, they could potentially use it, or at least it's in development. You know, it's this software that I've made is still a prototype, but I'd like people to know that it exists and that they can also contribute. <laughs> the PR requests or pull requests are very welcome. And I'm kind of looking forward to a day when that is more integrated into existing workflows. But there's kind of a question yet for me, which is how relevant this will be for real developers, actually. Uh, because when, a lot of the time when I talk to Akka or Erlang or actor people, and they say, oh, I'm working on a garbage collector. The first thing they say is, oh, fantastic. You know, this is such a great thing. I hate killing processes manually, blah, blah, blah. And then we talk a little bit more and they say, well, actually, I kind of designed my application around the assumption that there's no garbage collection. And I kind of mm -hmm. don't need actor garbage collection now. So it's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see if we give this to developers, how will they change the way that they program? And maybe I encourage people to think about how they're developing their systems and say, well, do you think that an actor garbage collector would help in this circumstance? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. How would you change your behavior if you had one? These are kind of interesting questions to be thinking about. 
down the line. I'm, you know, I've been in the ivory tower and now I'm trying to mm-hmm. bring, bring forth, you know, my work out to people. I'm saying like, Hey, check this thing out. One thing I'd like to hear from people over time is what are the types of applications that they're developing? How are they using actors and how can my work better serve what they're doing? All right. So advice is communicate, <laughs> share, contribute, and talk to the researchers. Talk to the researchers. We're, we're, researchers are just free. You know, we're doing free work for you guys. Like I'm subsidized. I'll do whatever you want me to. Just text me. <laughs> Send me an email. Fair enough. Fair enough. Manuel, do you have any thoughts as an author? Maybe you have some ideas as how we can better teach or communicate about garbage collection to new developers or developers who have never really had to think too much about their garbage collection? Well, I I could say with the information I have now, talk to the researchers. (laughs) It's a good advice. (laughs) Because I think from most of the developers in the backend, we are more worried about how the server is working, how is uh, the virtual machine behaving. And we keep in mind some of those aspects. But I have to admit that, for example, garbage collector is only worrying to the project when that is uh, failing. (laughs) So while that is working as expected, nobody is thinking about the garbage collector. Uh, The the things are working uh, smoothly, like a breeze, and it is not something that is in the roadmap. But uh, yeah, have the knowledge about uh, how it's using or how it's working the garbage collector and how could use the parameters the languages has for us to adjust it is very important. All right. Sounds great. So think about it before it's a problem and ask your researcher. Some important takeaways. As we kind of bring this to a close, I was curious, did you guys have any questions for each other or anything that you want to make sure you say before we wrap this up? Well, one thing I was interested in Manuel talking about was this, you roll your own Paxos or whatever implementation when you're dealing with failures. And I I, I take back what I said, that Akka is better at Erlang than being Erlang. That was maybe a little bit too far. But the idea from the perspective of being a garbage collection researcher, I'm wondering to what extent in the Erlang Elixir world, you could make sure that all actors have some kind of fault policy like this, you know, where if a node crashes, eventually that node will be removed from the cluster and never come back. Can you implement that as a library and then put the garbage collector on top of that library? Would that work in that world? I, I don't know. I'm not familiar enough with that ecosystem. Maybe that's a very technical question. Yeah. I, I mean, the garbage collector, as I said, is something that the people is not uh, worrying about too much. So when we are thinking about processes, actors, and uh, communicating be- between them, uh, even as you said, in different clusters, uh, in different nodes of the cluster, the garbage collector is only the, the small and specific part that is inside of uh, every node of the cluster that is handling that uh, when the node, when a process is dying, uh, that is, uh, we are recovering the memory to be in use uh, for another process. In Ireland, <laughs> messages are completely asynchronous. So when you are sending the message uh, to another process, you have not the guarantee that uh, you are, uh, you have the recipe about that the message is delivered. So if uh, the process is even dead for a long time and you have the PIP from the process, you send that message to a dead piece and uh, the system is accepting. <laughs> so it's completely asynchronous and it's not uh, checking that. The only way that uh, you get an error is if you are sending to a name, that name is related to a, uh, to a process and that process is dying. So the registering is removing the name and the name is not existing anymore. So that is the error you get. The name is not related to a process. But the point is that when you are developing in Erlang, you need to, to know that the, the messages could be lost. So you need to get the approach of sending the idempotent messages. The, so if you need to send it twice or in a third time to ensure that that is arriving, maybe it's needed and developing like a mechanics that is helping you to get, uh, well, what happens if something is failing in this point because I send a message and I get a timeout because I, I have no response. 
So you have to implement what is happening in case of the timeout. So it's a implementation in the high level. But uh, the point, because I was replaying you about the implementation of the raft, Paxos and others, is because uh, I have the feeling that when the, in the low level, you try to uh, implement something that should be in the application level, is uh, forcing to the developer to acting with that implementation is there is no chance uh, to, to change the implementation. So for me, as naive is the system uh, is better for getting the even the different layers of implementation and you can change those layers. Fantastic. I don't know it, to, to what extent I should clarify that, like, for example, in, in Aka, it is still asynchronous messaging and you still have a very similar, uh, you program Aka actors in a very similar way that you'll do with Erlang. The only difference is this particular case where if a node is gone for a very long time, what will happen? Will mm -hmm. those actors ever be able to rejoin again or will they not? So definitely no shade to the Erlang model. It's just for, for me trying to roll out this fault recovering thing, it's like, oh, dang, I was so close to being able to get this for Erlang as well. Mm -hmm. But just because of this tiny limitation, there's a, a slight difference. Sure. Awesome. So as we bring this to a close, just wanted to give you each a chance to do any plugs, ask for the audience. Dan, I know you said PR requests are encouraged. You want to just call out your side project or any way people can reach you? As a researcher, the number one way to contact me is by uh, looking at my website and then sending me an email. I'm also nominally on Twitter, and I do have a, a YouTube channel where I uploaded my thesis defense. If you're interested in like the technical details of how this stuff works, you can check that out. If there's more interest, I'd love to make more ex ex expository videos about how this work goes. Because, you know, I'm in, I'm in service of the public. I see myself that way. And another thing, so that the name of this project, it's called UIGC, and you can find it on my GitHub page. Yeah, we'll have that link in the show notes. And so there's some, uh, there's lots of issues. If you don't see an issue that appeals to you, feel free to reach out. Or if you just have a question about actor garbage collection, or you want to tell me about your experience about using actors or questions about any of that stuff, I'd love to talk to more practitioners about this type of thing. I'd also love to see an actor garbage collector for Erlang Elixir, if anybody can figure out how to do it. Awesome. Manuel, any asks for the audience or things you'd like to plug here at the end? Well, my, my main content is in Spanish, but in the page of altenbal.com, I have books now translated to English. The first book that was talking about Erlang as a language, the basics and how the processes are working, not working, uh, everything to, to complete a project. And the second book, that is uh, the volume two, is uh, talking only on uh, everything about OTP. That is uh, the part of the actor model, how it's compared to object-oriented programming, and uh, how is the implementation of servers, virtual machines, uh, supervisors, and everything. As well as I'm very active in, in Twitter, so we can share <laughs> the Twitter as well. And uh, that's all. All right. Well, Dan Plukin and Manuel Rubio, thank you both for your time. It was a really great conversation about the actor models and garbage collection. Thanks for having us. Elixir Wizards is a production of SmartLogic. You can find us online at smartlogic.io, and we're at SmartLogic on Twitter. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. This episode was produced and edited by Paloma Pachenik for SmartLogic. We'll see you next week for more as we branch out from Elixir. Hey, this is your ear flicker, president of SmartLogic, the company that brings you this podcast. SmartLogic is a consulting company that helps our clients accelerate the pace of their product development. We build custom software applications for our clients, typically using Phoenix and Elixir, Rails, React, and Flutter for mobile app development. We're always happy to get acquainted, even if there isn't an immediate need or opportunity. And of course, referrals are always greatly appreciated. Please email contact at smartlogic.io to chat. Thanks and have a great day.